This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Yehovah has always guided and protected us, even while we strayed from him. That's the realization that Rodney Thompson had after being arrested and committed to a mental hospital. In this episode, in his own words, you will hear why he felt he deserved hell, but was spared, thanks to the obedience of Yeshua's servants. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, there you are, Shabbat Shalom Torah <laughs> fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Have you ever looked back on your life and thought, how in the world did I ever survive that? Or maybe an impossible situation that looks even more impossible now that you look back on it. Well, Rodney Thompson has an amazing story you have just got to hear, and he's going to tell it tonight on the second episode of Impossible Odds. The disciples saw something impossible happen this week in history. Two days ago marks the anniversary of Yeshua's ascension on the 40th day of the Omer, and that's according to the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see it there. Now, please welcome my co-host, Angie Clark. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks Shabbat for having shalom, me, Scott. Angie. I appreciate it. You know, last week you'd mentioned just something in passing that, you know, some of Yeshua's disciples did not believe even after seeing him risen I, from the dead, I walking around. I can't wrap my head around that. Right. And then some people today, and then you mentioned before the cameras came on today that, um, you know, some folks yes. in in in, uh, in the faith camp of, of Christendom uh are kind of questioning Yeshua's divinity. divinity. The yes. same thing the disciples were doing, really. Yes, 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 so Why yes. is that? What, you know, what have you heard? Uh, with, with our ambassadors, we have prayer cards that we, you know, as a community, we come into agreement with. And that was one of the, the focuses this month was proclaim His divinity because it's being questioned in, in certain circles. And I understand there are certain religions uh, that, they believe that he is, you know, he was here. They believe he's a prophet, but they don't believe that he's divine. They don't believe that he is Yehovah in the flesh. Mm. And this has crept in to our society. So people are questioning the divinity of our king. Mm. Yeah. So this is things like, uh, I know Islam believes such a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And they mention Yeshua in yeah. the Quran. And but, I've, I've seen headlines of certain uh, religions, Christian religions, you know, they're questioning the mm. divinity of our king and it's it's kind of snuck in. Mm. It, isn't you know, that just like in the garden where the serpent said, did he really say that? Yeah. You know? So. We really need to be on guard, especially when we even talk of uh, having you know, midrash, you know, when we have like a, a Bible study mm -hmm. essentially on Shabbat. We do that at our house. We do that in, in our group. And, you know, we really need to keep prayed up on that. I know what you're saying because sometimes, you know, it, we're taught in this society to question everything. Yeah, yeah. And that, but that's one thing we shouldn't question, but somehow that's kind of, we forget that. I know. And in our midrashes and even that kind of stuff, you know, you can, if you think back to some, you know, some conversations you've had with others when you're discussing the Torah and the, and the uh, Birt HaTashah and, you, you kind of have to say, oh gosh, were we overstepping a line there? What, you know, you, yes, we should question things, but did we, you know, did we, you know, go a little too far there? Mm, good point. Yeah, wow. Good point. Okay, yeah. so yeah, we definitely need to keep that in mind. Proclaim his divinity. Proclaim his divinity, wow. Okay, so this is the 42nd day of the Omer. This is... Uh, I love counting up to, right? to yeah. Shavuot. I so love now, yeah, we're only eight days away from Shavuot. Wow. Yep, so very, very exciting stuff. And that's when uh, the... Well, I guess we'll talk about that next time, really. Because okay. that, that's when the, you know, the, the Torah and the Spirit really became one. Because we had the, you know, the, the fire coming down on Sinai. The covenant, and the, tongues the marriage of fire. covenant, yes. I, mean, I wonder how many people really think about that, right? Fire came down at Sinai, and fire came down and rested like tongues of fire at Pentecost. yes. 
on the same day. On the same day. Uh, Can't make this stuff up. Clue in here, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Right, right. Can't right. make this stuff up, yep. Now, by the way, uh, the, we talked about Rude Radio Podcast in the last mm-hmm. couple of uh, weeks because now we have the, uh, that Rude Radio Podcast is on uh, YouTube, Spotify. It's on your Apple Podcast. That's it's nice, too. It's fun. I yeah, like it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, the, but the backstory of everybody who's up here with Shabbat Night Live Ted Clayton interviews them Mm -hmm. and kind of understands where they're coming Mm -hmm. from. Something else Ted does every Tuesday. I don't know how many people do this, but you know, Ted's really up on this kind of stuff. And you need to, you know, with with ham radio. Him and Don Goodrich both. Yes. And they they, you know, that is really um, a good thing to do, ham radio for when it all hits the fan. Yeah. Especially for the stuff we're talking about here. Like our love gift is is based on that. No place to hide with Vera Sharab. We'll talk about that in a minute. But gonna yeah, be a very important thing in the near future. Yeah, we really need to learn ham radio. Mm-hmm. We we, knew, we do. And, and to get yourself kind of, uh, get your feet wet in this kind of thing, Ted and Don have this thing every Tuesday. Yep. And there's the frequency on the bottom of the screen. Now this frequency has changed recently. Uh, they found a better band with less, less noise. So there's where you go now to do the Messianic Net mm-hmm. on Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern. And you can just basically come together with other folks who are also experimenting with ham radio. Yes. Some people are experts, some people are brand new. So mm-hmm. don't feel like you have to be an expert at this type of thing. And uh, Ted and Don just sort of uh, lead you through some conversation there. And it's a good thing to get in practice and with. And people can reach out to them, Ted at michaelrue.tv mm-hmm. or uh, I forget Don's well, email address, but, but it's they'll on the have bottom it on of the screen. screen. That's right yeah. there. Yep. So there you yep. have it there. And yeah, because we, we often run. Um, classes about how to get yes. started in this type of thing. Because like Ted says, when everything fails, there's ham radio, Yep. right? Cell towers go down. I mean, cell towers can go down. When the power goes out, cell towers go out too. The only thing keeping them alive is, is a generator. Yes. And once that generator runs out of fuel, we're yep. done. Yeah. There's no more cell phones. Yep. So it's a good thing to check out. Yep, exactly. Now, uh, speaking of such times, No place to hide. We actually have a cell phone tower on the cover of this teaching here. This is our teaching for May, Mm -hmm. uh, and we have it for May specifically because of Israel's 75th anniversary. It all fell into place perfectly. It did, yes. And this is Vera Sharav. She is a Holocaust survivor, Mm -hmm. and uh, she warns. Now, she was with us two years ago, and she warned of things with COVID. Yes, she did. And now she's warning us about uh, the Great Reset and what's happening here, how it's all coming together. And she basically says, look, there's no place to hide here. You, you can't do like the, the Jews did in, in World War II and hide under in somebody's forest, floor, in the, yeah. in the forest, in, in somebody's like haystack, because the heat-seeking drones and then whatever else they're going to come up with will will find you. Mm-hmm. You know, they're even using uh, robotic police dogs in New York City already. I saw that. Yeah. So, you know, this kind of stuff is here. So... We really need to listen to the Spirit, mm-hmm. okay? So Vera, is, she's not a Christian believer, but she gets invited by Christian churches all the time because right. she has this very important Jewish perspective on these such mm-hmm. things. And she was actually rescued by a Christian family mm-hmm. during the Holocaust. So she has a very healthy respect and love sure. for our side of things, and she tells things from her side of things. Yeah. And uh, so this is the teaching for the love gift. Uh, we also have uh, this, if you wouldn't mind holding that up, Angie, this is 75 years of miracles. Israel's history and all the things that made it happen. Mm-hmm. So you'll get that and this for a love gift of $100 or more, or for $300 or more, you'll get this and this. It's really nice. This is the uh, the Shema mm-hmm. in English and Hebrew, made by um, people who have made Aliyah. Yes. And sometimes when they come to Israel and make Aliyah, they don't have a job. Right. So this company that gets that makes these things uh, actually gives them a job making these uh, Shema, Shema plaques. Beautiful, I love Beautiful. that. Yeah. Love so that. Angie, we're going to talk more about this stuff next week. Okay. We need to get to Rodney's episode. Yep. So we'll get to that. So Sounds great. In his own words, you will hear why Rodney Thompson felt he deserved hell, but was spared thanks to the obedience of Yeshua's servants. Mm. It's the second episode of Impossible Odds coming up next. But right now, it's time to get your bread and wine for the Kiddush with Michael. Stay with us. With international corporations pulling the strings and digital currency at hand, the great men of the earth are attempting to close the door on personal freedom. There's no place to hide. No attics, no basements, no haystacks, nothing. No place to hide. People really need to understand that, to grasp it. Holocaust survivor Vera Sharav warns of important comparisons between the Nazi regime and the Great Reset. 
who to watch, how to resist their tactics, and why today's technology makes the trap so much harder to escape. This teaching, No Place to Hide, with Vera Sharav, is our gift to thank you for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 to this ministry in May, we'll send you No Place to Hide with Vera Sharav on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you No Place to Hide, plus a coffee table book commemorating Israel's 75th anniversary and the miracles that made it happen. Donate $300 and we'll send you three gifts. No Place to Hide with Vera Sharav, the 75th anniversary book of Israel, and a beautiful piece of art featuring the Shema in Hebrew and English, made by immigrants to Israel. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Get these exclusive thank you gifts when you make a donation to support A Root Awakening International in May. Call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took our tone, our tone, leavened bread, and he blessed the Most High, and he broke the bread and said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. He took the cup, and he blessed the Most High, and said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. The following day, the following day, on the 14th of the month of the Aviv, there were two large loaves on the wall of the temple. And when they took the first loaf down, after that, no more bread, no more leavened bread was eaten. Then when they took the second loaf down, that's when all of the leavened bread in the city of Jerusalem and everywhere else was completely expunged. It was burnt in the fire. That was the rehearsal that was done the following day, just before the Passover lambs were sacrificed in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But Yeshua represents in this very thing in the breaking of the bread that we do, in the Kiddush, in the sanctification, every Shabbat, we remember that his body was broken for us. By his stripes, we were healed. And in the taking of this cup, as we say this prayer in thanksgiving to Almighty God, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Yeshua said this, is the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Every meal, any time, any Sabbath, any feast, any time that you need to remember his broken body and shed blood, we do this in remembrance of him.
I don't know if you saw last week's episode, and if you did not, you need to go back and watch it. This is an amazing story by someone we have never had up here on Shabbat Night Live. His name is Rodney Thompson, and Rodney came out of crack houses, and he told us last week of how just by eating the leftover fish for, from some drug dealers in a crack house that he was delivered after being arrested at his mom's house after robbing her. So let's pick up the story where we left off. Rodney, thank you again for joining us this week. It's good to be here. So you're telling this story, obviously very emotional for you. Your mom, you know, passed early recently, this year, yes. recently, and mm -hmm. I know how that feels. It's just, you know, it's tough mm -hmm. to lose a parent. You never know until you're there, and it's a club no one wants to belong to, but we will all be there one day. Yeah. So now you're telling the story of how you had robbed your mom's house, mm -hmm. uh, thrown a brick through the window, took all their their guns and their credit cards and all everything they had, mm -hmm. and then. Yeshua gets a hold of you in a crack house, and I wonder right. if you could just retell that that moment and okay. when you came home and, and encountered the police there. Okay, well, um, what we I was in the crack house, and, and and the whole backdrop is stolen vehicle. I'd robbed my mom. Uh, a pastor had just been led by the Holy Spirit into the hood and gave me the gospel, and and all of these things were playing in. So there was much much stuff going on and I was very much bothered. And But what happens when you're doing drugs for a long time and, and you don't eat? And so when you run out of drugs, you get hungry again. And so I was in this drug house, this, it's a crack house, and, and um, the drug dealers were cooking fish. And I was just pacing with all this pressure of all the things I had done. Done wrong, I was deserved hell, I was just feeling so bad about myself, the enemy's just beating me up, uh, you know? And uh, I'm walking around, but I'm hungry, and I asked these guys, I said, can you give me some food? And they laugh at me and say no. And so they just keep eating. And well, I end up walking around the room, to the room after they left, and I grabbed their plate where they had spit out the bones of these fish, and I started sucking the bones of their spit out. I was so hungry. And in the prodigal son, it says that when he was eating pig slop, he came to himself. And as God is my witness, there I am eating this, what I called pig slop. And Yeshua appeared before me. And it was like in the spirit, it felt like he had a mirror. And he pointed it right to my face and I came to myself. I saw me for the first time what I had become. Mm. It was so clear, and, and, and it devastated me. It really did. It produced a brokenness that I likened to Jacob wrestling with God, and he got the dislodged hip. Mm -hmm. and, so he, and that's when he received his new name. And this is where I think I experienced a reborn experience, and I cried out to him. Mm. And I said, Jesus, if you'll save me, I'll do whatever you want me to. And it was at that point that I received the promise of the Father. I had never read the Bible before. I started speaking in a tongue unknown, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what was happening to me. And then immediately I started hearing this voice. The Word of God says, my sheep will hear my voice and they will follow me. And I started hearing his voice, and he said, go get in that stolen van and drive it to your mom's house. Now, I, the van had no gas. Um, I had just robbed my mom you know, a few days before that, and, and so I, I, I like to say it like this. When Peter, when, when Peter and the apostles were abandoning Jesus because of his preachings, he was teaching on, you know, um, drinking his blood and eating his flesh. And all the disciples were leaving. And he turned, Yeshua turned to Peter and said, are you gonna leave me too? And Peter looked at him and said, where else can I go? You're the Messiah. Well, that's where I was at. I mean, Jesus, Je Yeshua said to me, go get in that van and drive to your mom's house. I had have no plan B. There was nothing else I could do. And so I just followed that voice like a child, broken. And I got in that van and drove to my mom's house and there the police were. The police were at my mom's house because somebody had broken into the house. And as soon as I pulled up, my mom looked at me and she knew it was me that had done it. Mm. And it just really crushed her. And um, just the timing of God, that too. You show up at the house, the police are there. You're probably thinking, great. God had Here a plan. <laughs> he was working this, and I, and I call this part of my story the prophetic history, mm. because this is where the testimony of Yeshua began. And if you would, I'd like to read Revelation. Please. Uh, chapter, nine, it's chapter 19, nine and 10. And it says, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. 
Then I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brothers and sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And this is where my prophetic history begins. And we each have one. We all have a testimony of Yeshua in our life. They will overcome by the testimony of Yeshua, the Word of God says. And so this is where the story of Jesus' instructions and the things He taught me began. Mm. So... You are arrested? Yes. What happens then? Mm. Do, you, do you go to jail or are you not? Or what, what happened? Well, there was a young man that, he was a sheriff that knew me and knew my family that arrested me. So I want to first off say he was very kind. Um, his, his name is Roger Roberts. And if he ever watches this, I just want to say thank you. And, and he was really nice and he was kind to me, but he, he arrested me. He put handcuffs on, put me in the car and took me to Troy, North Carolina. And from there, Somehow, still to this day, I don't know why. I had a dream about why he took me to Dorothea Dix Mental Institution. But um, I, that's for another time. I can share that later. <laughs> Please do. But I don't think you can get away from that now. You're going to have to share it. I'm going to have to share it. <laughs> but what happened was, is from Troy, for some reason, he took me to Dorothea Dix Mental Institution. It's in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, there it is. And, and actually, years later, I think maybe last year, I had a dream and Roger Roberts, as the sheriff, was in the dream. And, uh, and uh, in this dream, I, I said, why did you take me to Dorothea Dix? And he says to me in this dream, because there's angels there. Hmm. And I, the dream ended. Well, now I'm back in the real life testimony now. So this is not the dream anymore. So Roger's taking me to Raleigh and they take me into Dorothea Dix Mental Institution. I'm in handcuffs, remind you. Haven't eaten, I'm still hungry. And they take me in and put me in a hospital bed and they handcuff me to the bed. Now you gotta realize on the computers, I am a charged felon now. Grand larceny, stealing cars, breaking and entering. These are felonies. Um, this is just how it happened. I was sitting in this bed and I'm handcuffed like this. And a little short black lady, couldn't have been no more than five feet tall, walked in. And she started rubbing me on my arm. And she said, my precious Rodney, I'm going to send you to a Christian ministry. And I looked up at her and I said, just out of innocence, that's funny, I just gave my life to Jesus about six hours ago. And she went, I know. She uncuffed me from that bed. She gave me a bag lunch. She helped me up, and now, mind you, I'm wearing warm-ups that I had stolen from Walmart. I have a cut-off T-shirt of an old Pink Floyd concert T-shirt, and I have broken flip-flops, and I have no money in my pocket. I mean, I literally may have 50 cents, literally. That's, I have nothing in the world. Everything is gone. And she picks me up, and she hands me a one-way bus ticket to Florida, a place called Faith Farm. And uh, Faith Farm is a Christian ministry that was started years ago in the 50s by a man who was caught up in the heavens and shown visions of Florida and three parcels of land that he would have a, a ministry from. And so this, I, later after I graduated from Florida, I called back to thank this lady and they said nobody like that's ever worked here. And you have to remember something. Faith Farm, in order to get in, you can't have any charges against you. The computers were completely blank of any charges. So she put me on this bus and sent me to Florida. Wow. So, so with the sheriff, I was just curious, but I have to ask this. So when he's taking you to the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the mental institution, yes. he could have very well just taken you downtown, booked you. Yes. Th so you didn't get fingerprinted? You didn't get a mugshot? I don't remember any of that. Hmm. I just don't remember. Mm. Okay. I, if it happened, I don't remember. Hmm. I was in Troy, I was in their department, and the next thing I know, I'm in the car, and that same officer is taking me, he drove me all the way to Raleigh, which is about an hour and a half drive, and took hmm. me to Dorothea Dix Hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina. Wow. And I had a dream years later, why did you take me? He said, because there's angels there. Hmm. Now, if you call him today, he never said that to me in real life, this was a dream. 
But it, there I was. And then I encountered this black lady there who uncuffed me, gave me a one-way bus ticket. Suddenly, somehow, all the charges disappeared from the computers. Mm. And she put me on the bus and sent me to Florida. And months later, I called back to thank this lady and they said, nobody like that's ever worked here. Mm. So um, I like to call this the, the one year at Faith Farm. <laughs> um, and, and that's basically during this time in my life is where I received the call to evangelism. God started speaking to me about the Torah, even back in those days. Started so talking about touch no unclean thing. Mm. I'm just, and we're going to get back. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then, and really, he became a father to me. I, I was really healed of the father's wound. God became a real father to me in, the, in a moment of time of uh, just so uncertainty in my life. I didn't know where I was going. So when you get to Faith Farm, so you've, you've just recently given your life to this Yeshua who yes. appeared to you yes. in a crack house in yes. the most bizarre way. And I called him by the wrong name. I called him Jesus, and he still was willing to come. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> well, it's like someone is calling you sir, sir, across That's the story. Right. You're still sir. But well, I like, but I like right. to say it's the humility of God. I mean, if we get caught up too much in, into things, we lose the, the humility of God. I mean, when he showed up in that crack house, I knew... He was the creator of the universe. Mm. I knew. He was willing to be chosen last and come get me and wait for me, even though he had every reason to cast me into hell, to judge me, and to all these things. And I deserved hell, I deserved prison, but I didn't get it. I got mercy, I got grace. And, and that, that is, I was saved by faith alone. I did not receive, I didn't start following the Torah. I didn't receive the Spirit by the keeping of the Torah. That actually the scripture says. I received the Spirit by faith alone in Yeshua without any observance to anything. Right, and so you, you start feeling the call to, to preach Torah and all this kind of stuff, but what are they teaching you at the faith farm? Well, see, the, the, this is where the contrast comes. Okay. They, they're very dispensational place. Um, they teach in a lot of uh, dispensational beliefs. The, they don't teach the Torah at all. Right. It was by the Spirit of God that I started getting this. Hmm. And so I would be reading the Bible and, and the Spirit would be speaking to me. It was the same voice that led me out of the crack house. I recognized that voice. Hmm. And that voice was teaching me things different than what man was teaching me. And so I had, it was a conflict I was in. I was being discipled by man into certain beliefs, which they thought they were doing the right thing. They were trying to help me. I don't think they meant me any harm but it was not what the Bible was teaching. Well, I think, well, and Jehovah allows us to see that difference, right? So you need somebody to lead you through so you understand what other people are, are what, what they think is right. Well, and, Jer- and then you, you see, well, wait a minute, no, and then you don't know if there's a difference unless well, you're Well, in Jeremiah, it. it says they inherited lies from their fathers. There you go. Okay, and so when you receive a lie from your father, you believe it's the truth. So you're not trying to teach someone, you've just been deceived into what's truth. And I believe this is what was happening. They were teaching me things they had gotten from their fathers and their fathers and their fathers. And it was like, they're just teaching me lies that they received from their fathers. So they teach you this stuff, and and, to their credit, they think it's right, right? The lies of the fathers. Their heart's good. So you go back into your room, and you're reading the Bible for yourself now, with Yeshua speaking directly to you. That's right. And you're like, Wait a minute, this is what did I, I learned half right. an hour ago. Well, there, so what do you do with that? Well, what I did is I put the voice of Messiah down, which I shouldn't have done. I started listening to man. These people must be right. And so I started believing what they were teaching me and I started doing what the church, and I'm gonna start giving you the prophetic history of how God started speaking to me. And the first thing, the first thing first was a call to evangelism. Um, I'm going to be sharing some things that maybe some people listening or watching maybe has trouble believing. But these things happened to me. That's just all I can say. Um, the first big significant thing that happened is we were, um, yeah, we had, the, at Faith Farm, we were broken up into classes. And in our class, we had like six people left. And uh, we used to meet on Sunday morning before church. We was going to a Sunday church. I wasn't observing Sabbath any of those stuff during those days. So um, I was, um, so Sunday morning we would meet and one morning, um, Pastor Dick Moggett was one of the workers and pastors there, showed up at the meeting. 
And I mean, his tie was ruffled. He was always well done. His tie was ruffled. He was weeping. He, he was just tearful. And he walked in and he had a pail of water. And we're all just sitting there going, what's wrong with this guy, you know? And he's walking in and he's just weeping. And he says, I'm gonna wash your feet. The Lord had come to him and said, I want you to wash their feet. And this is, this is exactly how it happened. And so we were all sitting in chairs, much like this. There were six of us side by side. And Dan Hall was right here. And all my other guys was right here. And I was second. And Dick came over, Pastor Dick came over and started washing his feet. And nothing was really happening. And I was really just uncomfortable. I mean, what did, I've never had anybody wash my feet before. And so then he comes to me and takes my shoes off. And he starts washing my feet. And I mean, this man is under the unction of the Holy Spirit. He is weeping about just washing our feet and he's mumbling stuff. And as God is my witness, it felt like the ceiling of the roof fell in, knocked everybody in their chairs off the bed, off their chairs. Mm. I end up, next thing I know, I'm laying on the floor and I'm coming out and I'm uttering something. He's here giving gifts. He's here giving gifts. I believe the Lord came and gave me the gift of evangelism at that point. And, 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 I, and I, can, I liken it to this. This is exactly how it happened. It, 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 I'm not exaggerating at all. Everybody was on the floor. And to this day, I can call any of those people that are in that room and, uh, that, that are still living, and they will all say, yes, the same thing happened. Hmm. We don't know what it was. And so, but God came in the room. At, at a measure that just, it says the prophets of old fail of this dead when, when God came in the room. And, and, and so I can describe it like this. When I walked out of that kitchen room that day, I had the insatiable urge to go on the streets to start telling people about Yeshua. Mm-hmm. And so I was gifted, I think, with the gift of evangelism at that time. And Pastor Dick um, I've asked him numerous times, what happened in there? And he said, you were given the gifts of evangelism. Mm-hmm. And I believe it. And so there, I started my walk of being an evangelist, which is my calling in my life. So, Wow. I, I'm sure you're questioning this because, you know, you didn't grow up in a Pentecostal church or something like that where, you know, everybody is, quote unquote, slain in the spirit every Sunday morning. No. So this is something weird where this is genuine, it's um, real. It, you know, some of that stuff is questionable, but this was it obviously is. real. It, there's a lot of questionable stuff that happens in the charismatic camp. And 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 I won't and I'm fully tour observant now. And so God has fully shown this to me. And so I had to repent for a lot of the unclean stuff that happens in the charismatic camp. And I fully acknowledge that. But this was real things in the Holy Spirit that changed my life. Yeah. It was it 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 was like when you're a drug addict like I was. I had to meet Jesus. I couldn't just learn about him. Mm. So there had to be a difference between meeting Jesus or learning about him. I met him. Mm. I met him face to face. And it took me on the floor numerous times. Um, Well, that's what Yeshua says, right? I mean, those who come to me will say, we did this in your name. We did that in your name. Well, we knew about you, but you, Yeshua says, I never knew. I knew. And the question is, you may know him, but does he know you? Right. That's the question. And, 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 and I think it needs to be a question that all of us answer. You may know him, but does he know you? And that's a, that's a scary question. There's a lot of questions in the Bible that are not comforting when you read what the Bible actually says about the question. Mm-hmm. You know, where do people go when they die? You know, Bible doesn't give a lot of comfort. Right. You know? And the well, little- well, hang on one sec. Hold on to that thought. Okay. Because we're about to get into something really good here. I want to hold on and okay. let you tell the whole story <laughs> instead of, you know, one minute of okay. it. So, all right. So, <laughs> thank you very much for bringing Rodney here. Uh, just y- your gifts have made this all possible. So, thanks very much. Because without you, this, this doesn't happen at all. So, I just want to say thank you very much for doing it. Thank you for bringing Rodney here. And uh, others can see this in the future. How does that happen? With donations that continue. And if you'd like to do that again, we're gonna give you a couple of minutes. We'll be right back. Thank you in advance.
and thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live. Now, Rodney, before the break, we were talking about how you had this encounter mm -hmm. where everybody hits the floor in the faith farm, and there's just no explanation for it, and you are given the gift of evangelism. evangelism. So tell us about that. Where does this lead you after this? Well, at that time, you know, I'm at Faith Farm. I'm being discipled um, in who Yeshua is. And, and, and a lot of people have different opinions on that. And the Bible, you know, says what it says. But by the Spirit of God, the God started really after that, started speaking to me from um, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, which is, talks about touching no unclean thing. How can light be mixed with darkness? And all these kind of things. And so it was really, sorry, the Spirit started speaking to me about holiness, which I didn't know anything about. And, um, so I said, what is holiness? What is this yeah, well, unclean? And what? As far as my understanding go, I, I think there's the righteousness of the cross that God provides. There's nothing I can add or take away from that. But holiness is my walk in the flesh in this world. And, and basically, it is bringing my flesh into submission to the Spirit that's within me. Okay, so, so my behavior in this walk, how I'm walking my life is my holiness walk. And so God started speaking to me a lot from that. Um, he started uh, being a real father to me um, through the father's instructions from Proverbs uh, chapter two through four. He was speaking to me that was much about Torah, observing my commands, staying true to his commands. Mm -hmm. and, and God was speaking to that. But like I said, the church, the, the pastors to their own, their hearts were right, but they were teaching me away from that. And so I started following that. So I started actually putting these teachings away. And, uh, but, I, but I'm going to share it. So as I was doing that, I started doing what man wanted me to do. And, and which gets into performance approval type stuff. You know, am, am I going to try to seek the approval of man or the approval of God? You know? The Word of God says we need to fear the one who can place our souls in hell, not man. And so I started going through this very transition of who am I going to obey? But during this time is when I met my wife. And it was a very significant time in my life. Maria um, was a, a, a lady that I met. She's a nurse. And um, during this time, I was about to graduate from Faith Farm. And I've been there a year. And... Um, I wasn't expecting this. Actually, I prayed. I said, God, I am not looking for a wife. And if you want me to be married, you're going to have to bring a wife to me. Well, he did. And I met, I met Maria, and we have many um, miraculous signs and wonders about confirming our marriage together. And I mean, we met within a few months. We were married. Hmm. Um, and so when I left Faith Farm, um, we got an apartment together. And um, well, hold on, so we're, we're skipping some details yeah, we're here. Skipping hold on. a lot of details. Do, do, do you, want, you want to get into those? Yeah, or we not? can. Okay, we so can. you meet her. So what, how do you meet this nurse after coming out of the faith farm and just recently being delivered of all this junk in your life? How does that happen? Well, she came. She came during a revival. There was a man, Pastor Spidell, who was um, at our church, and it's the only man I've ever seen where I saw smoke coming from his hands. He was literally praying for people. I saw smoke, and Maria saw the smoke. And so we were wow. just talking. She heard me talk about it. So that's really kind of how we met. And then eventually, um, she, her testimony is actually this. She was led by God there. Um, the first time she saw me, she had seen me in a vision prior to that. The night that she got baptized in the Holy Spirit in Orlando, Florida, she, was, she had been a Christian her whole life and had never experienced the power of God any. And then she was like, if this is really real, I'm going to seek this. And she got baptized in the Spirit. When she got baptized in the Spirit, she saw me in a vision. Hmm. And she knew that I was going to be her husband. And when she came to that revival, she saw me. And, and it was like really kind of freaked her out. And, <laughs> and I mean, and so we ended up meeting that way. That's how we met. Wow. So miraculous signs and wonders. Uh, I remember um, speaking to her and I felt as if God was pointing a finger at her saying, this is the woman I've chosen for you. And I knew there was a scripture that goes with this, um, watering of our camels. I think it was when Isaac and Rebecca, that when he went, the sign that, um, he, that she would be his wife is she would water his camels. 
And God spoke to me that my wife would be one that waters the camels. And I knew the camels represented the ministry vision that he's given us. And she watered it. She brought water to the vision that God was bringing in our lives. And she still does. She still waters it in a way that's just beautiful. And she don't want any credit. She's never speaking or anything, but she's, we couldn't do what we do without her. So you guys are on the, the same, now that's very rare to have, you know, because when my wife and I met, we weren't on the same track or anything. Yeah. We had to sort of work through that, but it seems like right from the get-go, you guys are, you have the same vision, you're just gonna go for it. Well, so, it was later in life. Oh, later in life. I think so. I'm 40 years old and she's 10 years younger than me. And, and I had actually prayed. I was like, God, with everything I've experienced, if you bring a wife to me, she needs to be baptized in the Holy Spirit or she won't believe a thing that I'm saying or doing. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, I think it was just a, a divine connection. She was the one that he chose for me. Mm. And, and I accepted it. I mean, and we had so much confirmation. We were married within a month of, wow. me, of meeting. And that was how many years ago now? 2006. Wow, gee. 2006, we were married. And um, it was right after that though, we had gotten our townhouse or condo. She had a condo and we, we moved into there. And uh, as you remember, the, the, um, the, um, the bullets. Mm -hmm. You remember talking about the bullets? Yes, the three bullets that, that were in the backseat of your car. The backseat car, of the car when at. the drug dealer shot, shot the mm -hmm. car. It was during that time, right when I met my wife, we were sitting in a church service together and um, I was looking at the pastor preaching and the, the whole altar just went away and I saw a road. It was literally, I was awake and it was like I was looking at a, a, a TV camera vision playing in front of me. And all of these Jesuses just had appeared. And I knew that it was my past life and it represented all the sins that he had forgiven me of. Mm. And it was during that time. And then all of a sudden I saw those three bullets and the, the term Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was just really blasted at me. And I don't know if you've ever interrupted a church service, but I screamed at the top of my lungs at the kindness of God and literally fell to the floor. People thought something was wrong with me. I, I, I couldn't contain my emotions, the kindness of God. He was protecting me while yet I was still a sinner. Mm. And I, 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 I was, had no credit. He was not even a thought in my mind. I was everything against him. I was making fun of Christians and he was protecting me. Mm. It, this stuff like that is what changed me. I mean, yes, it's good to read about God and I needed to learn about God, but it was these things that changed me from being a hopeless drug addict to somebody who follows Yeshua as best they can. Mm. And, then, and, so, and then it was during that time I met my wife and we had our townhouse and our condo. I had to go get my driver's license, Florida driver's license, because I come from North Carolina. And when I showed up, guess what reappeared on the computers? felony charges mm. from all the stolen cars I had from breaking and entering. They reappeared. And guess what I had to do? I had to go turn myself in and be arrested. Mm. And there was my wife. We had just been married and I'm sitting there. I have to turn She's thinking, myself, what did I get what into? What <laughs> did I get myself into? She's never seen me even smoke a cigarette. And, and she, she's, she's, I mean, if she takes a, a ibuprofen, she gets dizzy. Right. She, she's never taken a drug her whole life, you know? And, and so there she is. And I'm like, I, I'm, I have to turn myself in. Does she, did she know about your past? Did you talk about I had things? just like, I had totally forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. Never had mentioned it to her, but she was with me 100%. I said, you know, she knew my history, you know, that I had this, I had been saved from drug addiction. But a lot of the details, she just, you know, there were so many details. I didn't tell her every single detail. It's not that I was trying to hide it from her. But anyway, so the, um, the charges reappeared. And so I turned myself in and went back to North Carolina right outside here in uh, Concord in Kannapolis. I got a lawyer and um, fast forward to the court date. Here we are, court date, and I'm going to go face grand larceny charges. And the family who had the stolen van was the one pressing the charges. Okay, the guy, the stolen van that I stole, if you remember from the first episode. He was at the cleaning company. The cleaning company. And, uh, and that's what I own now, it's a cleaning company. And, uh, and so, but I had pawned all of his equipment and there he was with his wife. And I asked, the, I, I had started my first business at the time. So I had money, my wife and I were doing good. She was a nurse. So I, I had money to give him restoration if he wanted it. 
And I was humble and I said, if you would, I asked my lawyer to go ask him if he would drop the charges, if I would pay, I'd pay him money for what I'd, harm I'd done him. And they both said no. They were upset at me and they wanted me to, to go through the court proceedings. And I'm just gonna tell it just like it happened. Like I keep saying, I'm not gonna add or take away from nothing. I'm just gonna say it way it happened. Um, when the lawyer came back to my uh, table where I was sitting, I was waiting for the, for the judge to start court. It was about 10 minutes before court started. And he said, he won't, he don't want to drop the charges. And I looked at him, I said, can I talk to him? And I said, he said, sure, you've got 10 minutes. And so he stood me up and he took me right out the door of the courtroom and there they were, it's a husband and wife team. And as God is my witness, the only thing I said was, sir, I said, I want to apologize to you for the things I did because when I did these things, I didn't know Jesus and now I do. And when I said that, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they both started weeping, literally, mm -hmm. walked into the courtroom and said, we drop all charges pressed against this man. So the judge, this lady, stands up and I'm sitting here just kind of like, what's going on? <laughs> really, I, I don't know. And, the, and the, the, the judge, it's a lady, she gets everybody in the seats and she says, Mr. Thompson, I want you to start up first. And she said, Mr. Thompson, all your charges are indefinitely suspended. And there was a term, a legal term she used, and to this day I can't remember what it is, but she said, your charges are indefinitely suspended. And like a child, again, there I am, weeping like a baby. Mm -hmm. And I said, just like my sin, mm -hmm. and it's just, just forgiven, just forgiven. And the, my, my lawyer, who was actually a, a, a church member, who never had seen the Holy Spirit, turned to me and said, I cannot believe this. She said, I have a secretary whose aunt has cancer. Will you come pray for her? So literally, there I was being charged for a grand larceny charge, and there I am now praying for some, my lawyer's um, um, aunt to be healed from cancer. That's literally how it happened. Um, it was literally freedom from prison hmm. years later. I mean, that's just, that's how it happened. Mm. Well, it's funny how, you know, it's, I'm hearing you say this, and it's not that the charges are dropped, they're just indefinitely suspended. Indefinitely suspended. So, so years later, I, I, I have advertisement that I do for my business. And years later, they did a background check on me, and they found that I had been charged for a felony, but I had never been convicted. Mm. So it's still on the computers that I had been charged, I just was never convicted. Mm. It's, I, I say that for a reason, that it's interesting that, you know, it, it's not dropped. It's Indeed. always there to remind you that Yeshua saved you from that. Mm -hmm. And if you ever go back, <laughs> those things well, will resurface. Well, the Bible teaches, you know. I mean, I'm forgiven. It says, there's so often, it says, if you continue in his kindness, yeah. um, these things will come. If you continue in his kindness, and even it says, in it, if you go back to your sin, the demons bring seven more with them, and you're worse off than ever before. There you go. So hence, the holiness walk um, is getting into the importance of holiness. And I, I, I like saying holiness is warfare for me. Um, not listening to the music that I listened to when I was on doing drugs, not taking part in the behaviors, um, sexual immorality, all of these things, uh, certain movies, all of these things are warfare to me. Holiness is warfare. Hmm. So do you see this as, did, did you think that God did that to, just to say, hey, just because I know you need this, you need these not to be dropped, you need these to be indefinitely suspended mm -hmm. so that you know that you can never go back to that. I want you to have that before you so that you'll continue following me. Do you think that's In Deuteronomy and the Torah, it teaches, is that when you've gained the ability to build fine homes and to gain wealth, don't forget that it was the Lord your God who gave you this ability. Less pride will enter your heart and you'll think it comes from you. Mm. That's a word for everybody. No, the, the ability to live a good life, the ability to love God comes from Him and Him alone. You know, and, and so I mean, then I started coming in to more dreams about the Torah. Um, it was during this time, you know, my wife and I had joined an Assemblies of God church and, and um, I had a wonderful pastor. I loved him. His name was Vinyl Thomas, just a great man of the spirit. I mean, this guy casted demons out. He uh, prayed for healing. He walked in the spirit and he was a chair walking, guitar playing, uh, ca <laughs> devil casting out. Pentecostal, and I loved him. <laughs> and I remember those days, they were just really fun days, but it was during that time, I had an impactful dream. And I was asleep one night, and in this dream, there was this huge gold cup in front of me. And it had frothy 
um, strawberry looking, very inviting and tasteful and sweet. And it had gold jewels all around the cup. Mm. Well, I started drinking from this cup and I was devouring it like a man thirsting to death, which represented my thirst for God. I was such brokenness and I was drinking, but something told me I was drinking from the expression of the Church of the West. Hmm. And as I kept drinking, I started noticing these particles of impurity that were in the liquid. And I knew they didn't belong. They're not supposed to be there. But I kept drinking, because I didn't know any better. And I just drinking it down. And then at the bottom of the cup, there was the head of a reptile embryo down on the bottom. His eye was looking up at me and I jerked it away from my, from my family, and it made me sick to my stomach. Mm. And the Lord spoke to me one of the first times, come out from among her, lest you share in the sins and plagues. And I knew, I knew by this dream that the Church of the West had a Babylonian spirit that had infiltrated into it, and that I was drinking from something that was supposed to be good, but it was Babylonian. Mm. And I couldn't put two and two together. I didn't have any historical context of what God was telling me, but later I started learning. Mm. And so he started leading me into all of these things. Um, and it was during this time that uh, we came to the call in Nashville. Very significant time in my life. Um, the call in Nashville, was a, there's a prophetic voice named Lou Engel, and he had a huge prayer meeting in Nashville on July 7th, 2007, and um, during this time, he called the nation to a 40-day fast. And so, and, and to be honest with you, I hadn't fasted more than two days. I, I had never fasted at all, and here is God calling me into this 40-day fast. So my wife and I went on this fast, 40 days, mm -hmm. uh, no solid food. We did juice and water, that's all we did. And some people just did water. Mm -hmm. And I, they called it the Elijah fast. And if you know anything about Malachi chapter four, you know, this is the end of this segment, isn't it? We're coming to the end of this segment. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, we'll continue yeah. next week, but let's start. That's right. But this segment, we're going to turn to Malachi chapter 4. So I went and did this fast. Well, what happened was this. We showed up in, um, we showed up in Nashville, and we broke the fast. And they call it the Elijah fast. And in Malachi chapter 4, it talks about, I'm going to send Elijah to you. But while I was, we broke that fast and I was in Nashville at the uh, football stadium. There was 30,000 people that had been fasting mm. there and they broke the fast and we're all praying. It's a prayer meeting. It wasn't a worship service, it was a prayer meeting. And I mean, it was powerful. I saw a vision when we prayed and Lou Engel got up and prayed that the spirit of Elijah would be imparted to God's people. And when he prayed that, I saw a vision of a rock being thrown into a pond and it went bloosh. And I mean, ripple waves went out. And I knew Elijah, the a spirit of Elijah was being sent to the world. And now it wasn't just because of what was happening there. It was in God doing it, but that's what I saw. But what happened, people don't realize Malachi chapter four is the verse before Elijah that gets you. Now I'm gonna read the whole chapter. It's just a few verses. It goes, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and evil doer will be chaff. And the day is coming that will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them with neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip like calves released mm -hmm. from the stall. I know what that feels like to be, you know what it likes to be chained and tethered to something and then you're freed? Do you know what that feels like? You just leap and skip like a child. You ever watch a child walk? They just skip. That, I, I wanna keep that. I don't want religion to steal that from me. I wanna stay skipping like a child. I, I want to, I fight for that. And so, and he says, you will tread down the wicked and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord. Verse four, remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statues and ordinances which I commanded him in, in Oreb for all of Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the children to their fathers and the fathers to their children so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now we're gonna meditate on that till next week.
We're going to come back and read that again. And There's see revelation what, on that. And see what your revelation was. That's great. Thank you, Rodney. So okay. we'll come back next week and explain that. Thank you for joining us. Hope you remember to read that. That is Malachi chapter 4, right? Mm -hmm. Just at the end, just a few verses. So read that, meditate on that. We'll come back next week and reveal what Rodney had revealed to him about all that. So thank you again for watching Shabbat Night Live. We'll see you next week. Until then, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.